Okay, let's get started. Hello, my name is Mike Ostap. I'm a professor of physiology, and I have been given the task to tell you everything you need to know about the mechanobiology of molecules in 45 minutes. Okay, so, um, so I hope you're listening really fast because it's going to be tough. But anyway, so, um, but what I've done is I've, I've kind of distilled this down to uh, some essential elements. Uh, to to get you started, you know some of you. So we have a real diverse expertise here, uh, but I've kind of aimed this a bit low, just to ensure that we're all on the same starting point, <clears throat> and so we know something about some of the molecules that many of you will be seeing in, in various labs and as well as uh, later on discussions. <clears throat> so there's my contact information. Feel free to email or call me. So the goal of my lectures are to provide, um, of this lecture, is to provide examples of how molecules, am I, am I staying within the right, uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> provide examples of how molecules mediate the sensing of mechanical stimuli. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna briefly discuss the molecular motors that power mechanobiology. So you hear a lot about mechanobiology and the response of cells. Uh, but you, you don't really hear about the power generators, the motors. So I'm going to spend about 10 minutes or so uh, on that. Okay? So <clears throat> a wide range of molecules work together in order to not only power uh, uh, movements of cells and tension within cells, but there's a lot of them that uh, are functioning uh, to sense the force, to initiate signaling cascades. Uh, they're they're um, present in order to reinforce certain mechanical structures. So these molecules sense this mechanical stimuli and uh, and um, uh, are able to react. And it's really quite remarkable as to as to the breadth of these types of molecules. So we have uh, we have the molecules that are um, pushing cells forward. So this is a um, a breast cancer epithelial cell, and uh, what you have is it migrating in this direction. So what you have is this leading edge of the cell moving forward that's being protruded by the polymerization of cytoskeletal filaments. You have the back end of the cell being squeezed forward through various contractile elements. You have molecules that are interacting from cell to cell that are, being, that are reinforcing this interaction and changing and signaling uh, on a short time scale to the leading edge but also on a longer time scale to the nucleus itself. You have molecules in the cell that are feeling the substrate, that are adhering and uh, changing their affinities and signaling to the cell what's going on on that substrate. So these molecules uh, are varied. Uh, in just about every type of molecule that you can think of uh, that you've studied in biology uh, can be hooked into this mechanosensing uh, network. So we have matrix cell and cell-cell adhesion proteins that are mechanosensitive. You have ion channels, which are proteins that depolarize the membrane or let in through certain uh, metals or ligands in response to mechanical changes. You have signaling proteins and scaffolding proteins that initiate um, uh, signaling uh, cascades that um, Upon a mechanical stimulus, you get this amplification of the simple signal that either reinforces the behavior, repels the behavior, or um, depolarizes the cell for some kind of um, uh, signaling um, uh, neuronal effect. We have cytoskeletal filaments. So these are the filaments at which molecular motors walk on. But these filaments also set up the overall structure of the cell and protrude and generate force and response to their growth rates and their positions, response uh, to mechanical stimuli. And finally, you have these molecular motors that use the energy in ATP hydrolysis to do mechanical work. And so what I'm going to do in my lecture is just to tell you very briefly about some of these molecules and kind of the general conformational changes or the general changes that these molecules undergo in response to uh, changes in uh, mechanical uh, uh, stimuli. Okay, so we're sensing and responding to changes in mechanics. So what are the different ways that proteins or other biomolecules can sense and respond to changes in mechanics? Well, many types of proteins uh, have their intermolecular bonds 
affected by mechanical load, right? So if we have, that looks bad. If we have a situation where we have um, an extracellular matrix connecting integrins through cytoskeletal proteins and um, focal adhesion um, plaques, you've got the cytoskeletal proteins connecting to the nuclei. So all of these proteins are connected to each other through non-covalent bonds. And these bonds are sensitive, in many cases, to mechanical loads that are put on them. And so these bonds include slip bonds. So a slip bond is a non-covalent bond whose dissociation lifetime decreases with force. So if we look uh, at a graph of the average bond lifetime, so how long does a bond stay attached? As a function of the force pulling on it, a slip bond's lifetime will decrease with increasing force. So I think that's really intuitive, right? So as you pull on something with more force, it's going to let go faster. But there are other kinds. So that's so a cell can respond to that mechanical um, <clears throat> effect through the slip bond. But there are other kinds of bonds. Uh, and uh, importantly, in mechanobiology, <clears throat> we have something called catch bonds. So a catch bond, shown in blue, shows an increase in bond lifetime with increase in force. So as the tension increases on the force, this goes from a weak interaction to a strong interaction until at some point the bond fails and becomes a slip bond. So there are also uh, things called ideal bonds, which are largely insensitive to force. But I think in most cases what you're going to see here are these slip bonds or these catch bonds. And these complicated cellular machines uh, have these interactions uh, that respond to force and uh, in generally in one of these two ways. And I'm going to show you some very cool examples of this catch bond and how it's important in a focal adhesion. So we also have mechanically induced conformational changes in molecules that affect signaling. So not only can we affect these intramolecular interactions, we can do something intramolecularly which affects the ability of the protein to signal. So generally, uh, what one sees is that when uh, you have a protein and load is put on the protein, you reveal some kind of binding site or some kind of phosphorylation site. And this mechanically induced change in the protein structure can set off some kind of signaling cascade. Okay, so, so um, and it can go both ways. You can pull on it and reveal a site or pull on it and hide a site. So these molecules uh, are sensing mechanics uh, through an overall structural change. We also have ion channels that respond to mechanics. So ion channels, of course, are these important uh, proteins that allow signaling through a membrane. And um, they result in depolarization of the membrane, which is very important for transmission rapidly of signals. <clears throat> but channels also allow um, um, uh, ions or bio biomolecules through that have uh, downstream signaling effects. <clears throat> so mechanical changes in membrane tension or changes in membrane cytoskeletal interactions can affect the ability of a mechanosensitive ion channel to open and close. And I'll show you uh, very briefly some uh, examples of that as well. Okay. Aha. Okay. <clears throat> so cytoskeletal proteins, the cytoskeletal filaments, and cytoskeletal motors <clears throat> are the proteins that are responsible for generating force. Right? We have microtubule-based motors, and we have actin-based motors. So these motors are not only generating the force, these filaments and uh, cytoskeletal motors respond to forces. The power output of a molecular motor dynamically adjusts to how much load is on that motor. It's really quite an amazing machine, and I'm going to show you an example of that later. <clears throat> the ability of a filament to polymerize and generate force through this polymerization is also mediated by mechanics. You can either uh, have force in this direction to make the filament uh, polymerize faster or the opposite direction to make it slower. Also, proteins that bind to cytoskeletal filaments, for example, things like formins, are able to modulate at how fast this growth goes based on the mechanics. <clears throat> 
Okay? So here we're just scratching the surface. Okay? So these are just some really basic ideas of what these molecules are and how mechanics affects the activity of these molecules. So there's no way in 45 minutes we can talk about few further proteins, uh, further mechanisms, or any of these in detail. So what I've decided to do was just to pick a few well-characterized, important examples, real-world examples of these, and just tell you something about them very briefly. Okay? Any questions so far? All right? Good. <clears throat> so let's talk about some of these proteins in terms of a focal adhesion. So I think most of you know something about focal adhesions. So these are these really important uh, com this really important complex of proteins that binds to the extracellular matrix. Okay, and th this, it binds through integrins, and it creates a very complicated signaling complex that signals to all over the cytoplasm, uh, but also has direct links to the actin cytoskeleton and ultimately to the nucleus. And stimulation through integrins, through this focal adhesion, has very short-term and very long-term effects on the cell. So through focal adhesions, cells can sense applied forces, and they can, they can uh, um, sense uh, the mechanical properties of the extracellular matrix. So I'm not going to talk about this in detail since you're going to hear about it later. Um, but importantly, it can sense the rigidity, the topography, uh, even, even the overall orientation of the extracellular matrix. Uh, be, through the signaling, cells can change their shape, their orientation. Um, uh, it can uh, modify intracellular processes in, re in relation to these uh, uh, mechanical forces. And these adhesions develop along the direction of applied force. So these are really important mechanobiology hubs. And if you guys aren't already studying them, uh, at some point you will. Okay. And they're very cool because even their lifetimes, even the ability of these proteins to assemble and ultimately uh, signal, changes occur within minutes, okay? Less than minutes, depending on what's going on, what's binding to these integrins. So what are some of these mechanical sensing molecules in these integrins, and how do they work, and how do they fit into that framework of proteins I just introduced you to? So, um, so this is a, um, now a classic paper from the Waterman lab showing some of these molecules in this focal adhesion. So here you have the intracellular matrix, here you have um, these integrins, and here you have all of these really important structural scaffolding and signaling proteins that ultimately interact with the actin cytoskeleton. Okay, so what I'm going to first do is tell you uh, about uh, uh, just a couple of these proteins very quickly. One isn't listed here, but first... I'm going to tell you about this protein, uh, talin. So this is a protein that, um, that binds to this, to this that's uh, localized in this complex, and it's really important for the force-mediated strengthening of this complex. So what do I mean by that? Well, when there's mechanics, when this thing is mechanically loaded, this adhesion matures and stabilizes and doesn't fall apart very quickly. And talin is one of these proteins that is able to sense this mechanical change. So there was a really cool paper from Mike Sheets a number of years ago that um, showed that stretching of the talin rod activates another one of these important proteins called vinculin, which is really important for the, uh, ultimately for the connections with the actin cytoskeleton. So this is a three-dimensional um, uh, three depiction of a folded um, tail and rod piece, okay? And what happens is that vinculin binds to a piece of this, of this molecule. And so this piece of this molecule isn't revealed for binding until this part of the tail and molecule is stretched, okay? And so mechanically, once the integrin is activated, this tail and molecule in green becomes stretched by, uh, through its interaction um, with the, actin cytos with the actin cytoskeleton, which then allows this vinculin to bind to this revealed uh, region here. So this is a reoccurring theme in mechanobiology, is that you have these structural changes in molecules that allows other proteins to bind. 
So, but this can even be further amplified in cases of uh, enzymatic activity. So there's a protein called P130Cas, which is a 130 kilodalton scaffolding protein that lives in the cytoplasm uh, when uh, cells aren't adhered to anything. So in this protein, has this region uh, that becomes um, uh, that that contains uh, um, sites for phosphorylation. So after integration, after activation of integrins, um, this complex moves to the focal adhesions, and a tyrene phosphorylation of its substrate domain occurs. Okay, and through this phosphorylation, further signaling is uh, occurs. Upon mechanical stretching, as you can see here, uh, this Cas substrate domain unfolds and expose uh, cryptic tyrosines that are then phosphorylated by CERC family kinases. And this phosphorylation now sets off a very, fairly substantial signaling cascade uh, that includes RAP1, GTPases, ERK, and other signaling proteins. So for this talk, these details of what's being activated and what's signaling aren't important. What I'm just trying to do is give you a sense of the type of conformational changes uh, that occur that allow mechanobiology or mechanosensing to, to occur. Okay, so, so what kind of forces are required? What are we actually talking about? Okay, so we have a protein uh, that's largely folded and when it's not under load, and it binds to this substrate, something is revealed, and you stretch it, and then you reveal some more phosphorylation sites that can set off the signaling ca cascade. So um, one of the things that I really don't want to do is get bogged down in the math or the transition state theory in order to understand the mechanical unfolding of proteins. But there is a really simple way to understand some of this um, through some very simple uh, uh, high school chemistry that you know. <clears throat> So how much force does it take to unfold these? What are the limitations? How, what's the, um, uh, how does force affect an equilibrium constant between two states? Okay? So let's say we have this molecule okay, right here. And uh, we move it in space using a force to a new location. Okay? So that's delta x. Get it? All we're taking is a molecule and just moving it. Right? We're, we're doing some work on it to move it, and the work is the force times distance. So the delta G, the change in free energy between this molecule and this molecule, is simply the amount of work it took to move it. Okay? Simple. Right? Force times distance is the work, so the amount of... It's just, you just moved it. Okay. But now let's say we have a geometry similar to what we've just been looking at. So we've got this molecule that's got multiple domains, and it's in this state. But it also can live in this state, where it's, um, it's in a different structural state. All right? So in the absence of any kind of force, there's a delta G. So there's that equilibrium constant between those two states. And you all know how to calculate that delta G. I'll remind you of that, of that uh, equation in just a second. Okay. So just letting it, just this free energy difference is in the absence of tension is just that delta G zero. But now what if we take some force and then we pull it in the dimension, in one dimension, okay? So the amount of force times the distance to get is that force times distance, just like above. <clears throat> so the new delta G in the presence of this force is the delta G in the absence of any tension and uh, the delta G uh, and the force times the change in distance uh, due to that uh, applied load. Okay? Right? So there's nothing really complicated there, right? So I think all of you remember that an equilibrium constant is equal to E to the delta G over KT. Okay? This, was, this should look familiar, I think. If you didn't remember it writing it down, I think it should be familiar now. Okay, so for this first case, that was really super easy to calculate, right? So now what happens when we put that force times distance in there? Well, if, if, um, if uh, we just do the simple algebra, 
we end up with e to the delta g minus this force times distance divided by kt. And so this equilibrium constant, e2 divided by e1, is ultimately equal to that equilibrium constant in the absence of force times e to the force times distance over kt. Okay? Nothing too serious, no serious math here. But the only reason I'm showing this is because if you know this and you think about it in this simple case, you can just kind of put some back of the envelope numbers in there. Right? So if the length change is 4 nanometers, so most proteins, you know, are in the nanometer size, so that's not so crazy, then a force of 1 picanewton will change the free energy by 4 picanewton nanometers, which is 1 kT. Okay? So it doesn't really take much load in order to undergo that conformational change. I mean, it's just thermal energy, right? So this is just, these are some just good numbers to know. So when you're think about, thinking about these types of overall scale changes, you can kind of think about this. And in a few minutes, I'm going to show you some of these numbers, okay? So that are related to catch bonds or related to molecular motors. So we're just talking about motions and numbers and forces, just not so much about thermal energy. Okay, <clears throat> so let's just move on quickly to adherence junctions. So like a focal adhesion, an adherence junction is a really important connection that a cell makes. But an adherence junction, it's not a connection to the matrix, it's a connection between cells. Okay? So these adherence junctions are mediated through these proteins called cadherins, which are ultimately connected to the actin cytoskeleton through uh, beta catenin and alpha catenin. So adherence junctions are within tissues and organs where distinct cell types coexist. Um, these adhesive contacts, like the ones with the extracellular matrix, are really important because they're external cues as to what the cells are supposed to be doing. Mechanical loading, like those other focal adhesions, are really important because the stability and the signaling of this complex is directly related to the amount of force on that complex. So cells don't really know what they're supposed to be doing. They don't undergo the correct fake decisions and uh, the right uh, morphology unless the right mechanics are on these structures. So force transmission at adherent junctions is a driving force of cell migration and tube development. And I'll show you just a cool movie on that in just a second. So this is the simple picture of it, right? So you have these cadherins and you have them connected to these uh, various complexes. And again, this is this simple uh, connection here. But I'm just showing you this cartoon really to emphasize the really substantial signaling that occurs uh, um, as a result that of this junction being made. Okay? So adherence junctions are really important for lots of things like uh, epithelial folding and tube development. And so these epithelial uh, uh, adherence junctions occur at these actin-rich rings. And contraction of actin and myosin allows these things to fold. And in this Drosophila uh, embryo, you can actually see that the uh, ectoderm gets zipped up. And there's really lots of beautiful movies of this. Um, so this is what you're looking at is um, the zipping up of the external layer of this Drosophila em embryo. And this is mediated, this conne these connections are mediated through these adherence junctions. Okay? So what are some of the properties of these connections across the adherence junctions. So you've got these uh, E cadherins, and you've got these beta catenins, and these alpha catenins, which ultimately bind to the actin cytoskeleton. So it turns out that this connection from, this, uh, from the um, cadherins through to the actin uh, is a catch bond. So the connection to actin gets stronger when there's more force on the system. So just to remind you, a catch bond is the one that gets stronger. This lifetime gets longer um, as, the, um, as the mechanical force, this tensile mechanical force increases. 
And so now this was really puzzling to the field for a while because people knew that this, uh, this alpha catenin was binding to actin. So there was these general cell biology pull downs, and they were adding beta catenin. And, um, but different people were getting different answers, and some people would say, no, no, the alpha catenin really isn't binding, or it's not binding tightly enough to do anything. Uh, but several uh, groups, um, and uh, I think very definitively, this group, Alex Dunn's group um, at Stanford, showed that really, in order to see that this to see this binding in its real binding mode, you have to put load on the system. Okay, and so um, this is an electron micrograph, so uh, showing a cell-cell junction. So here's a cell-cell junction here, and see this kind of haze. These are actin filaments. And these actin filaments are connecting uh, to this adherence junction. And so what this group did was use uh, an optical trap uh, with some recombinant proteins. So they added uh, a GFP uh, E cadherin that's attached to the substrate, then a beta catenin and an alpha catenin complex. And then they brought that into contact with an actin filament that was held between two beads in an optical trap. So does anyone not know what an optical trap is? Has anyone not seen an optical tweezers? OK. <clears throat> so very briefly, uh, an optical tweezers or an optical trap is a device that you can use to focus uh, infrared light um, in such a way that you can trap a particle due to the um, uh, bending of these beams. OK, so because you're changing um, uh, the momentum of the light, uh, there's a vector, a force vector, that's put on these uh, beads. And if you focus it just right, you can hold this bead in the focus of that, uh, of that highly focused trap. So this is really cool because you can move stuff around and you can, you can hold these various beads up. But where it becomes very powerful in mechanobiology is that not only can you move beads around, but you can use the trap as a way to measure forces. When the bead is held in the trap, it's held in the center of the trap. But if the bead gets moved out of the center of the trap, there's a restoring force within a certain range that's very much like a spring. So a well-constructed optical trap has a constant spring constant. So if you know the distance that this is moved out of the center of the trap, and you know the trap spring constant, you can calculate how much force it took to move that bead out of the center of the trap. And important for mechanobiology, these forces that it takes to move out of the center of the trap is on the range of piconewtons to tens of piconewtons, which is just the right range. So what these guys did is they took this protein complex, they put it on this pedestal that's adhered to a cover slip, they attach an actin filament to a bead, and then they, they, they let it attach, and then they moved the stage. So when they displaced the stage, they put load on that complex, which they can measure in the trap. <clears throat> and when they did this, uh, they can measure the mean lifetime of the, of, the, uh, of the complex actin attachment as a function of force. And so here you can see in these black lines, these black dots are the actual data. And you can really see that this is acting as some kind of a catch bond. As the amount of force increases, the lifetime of that bond gets longer until it reaches a certain point, and then it slips, and then you get a slip bond. So this is really important uh, because if you're going to be generating forces and you're going to be sensing forces, uh, this provides um, a, a way to calibrate these forces and a way to stabilize these adhesions um, through mechanics. They were able to model this interaction uh, so it interacts at low forces and high forces. And there's a weak binding state and a strong binding state of the complex. And whether you're in the weak or strong binding state, um, that's affected <clears throat> by how much load is on the bond. Okay, And then this, this uh, simple model gives you this catch bond-like behavior. Really quite amazing. <clears throat> So it's not these adherence junctions, only these adherent junctions, that show this kind of behavior. There's these proteins called selectins that bind to um, 
uh, glycoproteins that are very important for mediating the, the tethering and rolling of leukocytes during vascular, uh, on vascular surfaces while these uh, leukocytes need to um, go through the, um, the endothelial cell la layer to invade and fight infection or do whatever they do. So as this complex binds to this endothelial layer and rolls around, <clears throat> this rolling is mediated by this catch bond behavior. <clears throat> so if you have uh, selectins adhered to a bilayer and attached to the tip of something called an atomic force microscope, uh, you can actually bring this tip of this cantilever down, interact it with that selectins, and then put load on it. And depending on how much load you put on it, uh, um, uh, you get differences in lifetimes. And just like I showed you with that, uh, that uh, alpha-catenin complex, um, these selectins also show catch, long, catch bond behavior. So again, you have uh, a reoccurring theme of these uh, catch ponds playing an important role um, in mediating these um, cell adhesions. Okay, any questions about that? No? So how's the level of this? Too low, too high? Let's kind of get a sense. Well, maybe you'll tell us later. Okay. Yeah, okay, it's okay? All right, okay. <clears throat> okay, so now, other than these intramolecular interactions, we also have very important mechanosensitive devices called mechanosensitive ion channels. And as I told you uh, at the start, is that these mechanosensitive ion channels transduce mechanical force into biochemical signals for a large number of physiological purposes. Okay? So these things depolarize membranes. So everyone knows about excitable cells and depolarization of membranes, right? <clears throat> but they also let ions through that are important for signaling beyond the polarization, depolarization. <clears throat> In prokaryotes, excuse me, <clears throat> In prokaryotes, <clears throat> mechanosensitive channels act as emergency valves for release of osmotic stress. So if the cell starts to expand and the tension gets really high, these, these ion channels sense that uh, osmotic stress and uh, take the appropriate action. In plants, mechanosensitive channels likely participate in touch, gravity sensing, osmotic pressure, and other developmental events. <clears throat> and in animals, mechanosensitive channels participate in the central nervous system. Amazingly, we can hear because of mechanosensitive channels. And I'll touch on that very briefly. I know Ben Prosser is going to come back to that in his lecture, which you'll see recorded at some point. <clears throat> so it's important for hearing and touch, uh, visceral uh, pressure sensors, and uh, for these, these are cells that are important in the central nervous system. But just ordinary, everyday, boring cells uh, regulate their shape and motility and differentiation and cell cycle through mechanosensitive ion channels. So these, these channels can uh, sense changes in membrane tension uh, through membrane thinning or lipid disordering. I'll show you that in a cartoon in just a second. Uh, but they can also sense the tension through changes in their connections with the cytoskeleton or ec the extracellular matrix. Okay? And uh, it's these interactions outside of the membrane that may in, uh, activate the mechanosensitive channels. <clears throat> so mechanosensitive channels um, uh, can be activated through just changes in the lipids all by themselves. So the channels will be closed, uh, but upon some kind of uh, membrane thinning or change in the order of these lipids or change in the uh, tension within the membrane, uh, you can open these channels. And so for some reason, the resolution of this projector is pretty crummy. <clears throat> but this is just showing a cell changing size, which affects the ultimate membrane tension, which results in the opening of the channel. Crystal structures of um, uh, some of these uh, mechanosensitive channels have been solved in the open and closed states. And I think you can probably guess which one is which. And um, uh, so there's, there's these simple channels. But then in eukaryotes, there's these really complicated, really beautiful channels called piezo channels. 
<clears throat> and these channels have just all kinds of really interesting functions uh, that you might not even guess, but relating to, to touch and pressures within the body. <clears throat> but these channels all take advantage of some kind of changes in the membrane, whether it's the positions of the lipids or just the tension uh, in the membrane itself. So we also have these channels that bind to either the cytoskeleton or the extracellular matrix, and it's changes in the position of this um, relative to the membrane that allow the membrane to open. And so this includes some channels that may be associated with the focal adhesion. So this is a paper that's uh, um, uh, cited a lot. I can't actually remember. Maybe Rick knows what the Sokabi um, at a uh, Sokabi lab uh, that has these mechanosensitive ion channels that are associated somehow with focal adhesions. And tension on the focal adhesion somehow, and the uh, accompanying membrane, somehow affects the opening of these channels. So I went back and looked at this paper. It's pretty intriguing, but I don't know if I'm convinced, but maybe the field knows something better. Okay, but even in hearing, we have these really remarkable cells called hair cells. I don't know, who's ever seen a picture of a hair cell? Yeah. So it's these cells that stick into the, to the endolymph of the ear that are like, that have these projections called stereocilia that are like little antenna. And these little antenna are all connected to each other. And when there's vibrations in, the, um, in this extracellular fluid, these little antennae move relative to each other. And when they move, they pull on something called a tip link. And pulling on this tip link opens up a channel, depolarizes the channel, and sends a signal to your brain. Okay, so there's these mechanosensitive channels that are absolutely vital for your ability to hear. Uh, there's still a lot of research in this, and um, they're just now narrowing down what that channel is, which is really turning out to be quite complicated. Okay, so now in the last few minutes, let's talk about my favorite subject, and it's the molecular motors. Okay, so molecular motors power mechanobiology. So we've got all of these sensing mechanisms. Everyone in the CEMB is so interested in the sensing mechanisms and the downstream and the uh, changes in, in uh, gene uh, expression and um, the ultimate, ultimate differentiation of a cell. But it's all got to start with the motors. So we, we have basically uh, uh, three flavors of motors. We have two flavors, these kinesin and dynein cytoskeletal motors, that interact with microtubules, and they play a very important role in moving vesicles around in all cells, but especially uh, in neurons, as you can see these things moving up, these little particles moving up and down um, a projection of a neuron <clears throat> uh, in bi directions through, in two different directions using kinesin and dynein. We also have actin-based motors, which are myosins, which come in lots of different flavors, which I'll show you in just a second. So we've got the kinesin dynines and the myosins, which are the actin-based motors. And these are the motors that drive muscle contraction. They're important for moving our cardiac and skeletal and smooth muscles. Uh, these myosin twos are important for uh, cell migration and signaling in cells. And there's other cells, other myosins, that are important for moving vesicles around. All of these motors are important for mechanobiology. All of these motors uh, sense changes in the mechanics of their systems, and all of them have biochemistries and mechanical properties tuned for their specific cellular functions. So the myosins, for example, we have 38 different myosin genes in humans. Every cell in your body contains myosins, and they can be phylogenetically sorted into 12 different families. And these myosins do everything from moving endosomes around to um, uh, having a role in protrusions in, that, in those hair cells and setting the right tension on those channels so they can be ideally tuned to sense the vibrations in the fluids, uh, important for muscle contraction and cell migration. And the ones that are in those focal adhesions are uh, the myosin twos that play really important in putting tension on those stress fibers and communicating to the nuclei. All of these myosins follow the same biochemical cycle. 
They bind to the actin. They hydrolyze ATP. They undergo a conformational change that moves a lever arm relative to the actin filament that causes a displacement. So although all of these myosins follow the same overall pathway, the properties of this, of this pathway uh, that allow the myosins to support all these different functions are different, are, are highly dependent on the biochemical pot pathway that drives this myosin. <clears throat> Cytoskeletal motors frequently act as catch bonds. Okay, so remember the catch bonds are the ones that have longer attachment durations with load. But the type of catch bond that a motor uh, undergoes is very different, and it's linked to its biochemistry. And I'm going to show you that because it's so cool. Okay, so this is the myosin ATPA cycle I just showed you in that, in that, in, in that movie, in that ATPA cycle movie. <clears throat> so the myosin, in the absence of nucleotide, binds tightly to actin. It binds to ATP. It detaches from actin. It undergoes a reverse power stroke. It binds to actin. And upon phosphate release, see the lever arm rotating? That's the force generating power stroke. That's a stretching of whatever mechanical spring it is. This is the source of mechanobiology right there. Okay? It releases ADP and goes through the cycle again. <clears throat> so for almost all myosins, how fast you detach from actin, the cytoskeletal filament, and the length of uh, the duration of the actin attachment time is related to this ADP release step. Okay, and so this is the cycle again. So when the myosin is bound to the actin and it's strongly bound, this is a force bearing or strongly bound state that gives force to the system. <clears throat> So it turns out that this ADP release step, the step that limits how fast you can detach from actin, is force sensitive for many myosins. And this is where the catch bond activity for the myosins comes into play. And you're going to see how different this is in just a second. Okay, so the idea is that the myosin undergoes its power stroke, right? So the rotation of the lever arm, you see that spring being stretched. The myosin lever arm has to undergo another rotation. But if there's load on this myosin and you're preventing its rotation, you can slow this step in the cycle. Okay? If you slow this step in the cycle, you can prolong the amount of time you're in a force-bearing state. And you can actually measure this, again, using an optical trap. So you can take a single actin filament, string it between two beads, Hold it on next to a myosin that's bound to a substrate, and you can measure its attachment. So it's detached, attached, detached, attached, detached. Okay, so you can measure these attachments. You can measure the kinetics. You can measure the displacements. But importantly, you can also pull. You can move the trap and put load on the myosin and measure how long the actin stays attached as a function of force. So this is the actin detachment rate. So this is the inverse of the lifetime. You can see that it, it, it detaches much more slowly as a function of force that's resisting the power stroke. So this is a catch bond behavior. <clears throat> now this catch bond behavior, oops, this catch bond behavior is different than the catch bonds that I showed you before. The catch bonds that I showed you before just dealt directly with this molecular interaction between one protein and the other. Right? The more load you put on it, the stronger that is. This catch bond stays longer because you're changing the rate at which you go through the ATPA cycle, and you change the fraction of time that you, uh, the amount of time that you're strongly bound to the actin before detaching again. Okay? It's a fundamentally different mechanism, but it's a catch bond-like mechanism. And so this mechanism exists for these myosins that are uh, interacting with the focal adhesion. So uh, here I'm just showing different myosin isoforms, the actin attachment lifetime during ATPA cycling as a function of force. And you can see even in the absence of force, different myosins have orders of magnitude different attachment durations. And then once you apply force, 
the amount of force uh, that's applied has very different effects on how fast um, this, uh, the, how much this slows down. Okay? You can even do things like calculate the amount of power output from these different myosins as a function of force. And you can see that the different myosins have very different power outputs as a function of load. Right? So what about the cytoplasmic isoforms? What you can do is no one's really done a careful measurement of the cytoplasmic myosin-2 isoforms yet. But we can calculate what this could be doing. And you can actually do a simulation. So this is uh, an actin filament. Each one of these lines is a myosin. Okay? And what, when the myosin's attached, you can see it interacting. The amount of force that's on the myosin is color-coded. So the more yellow it is, the more force is on. And so what we did is we took the myosin 2A, 2B, and 2Cs and let them equilibrate to reach a constant force. And what you can see before we even start this, the, the movie is that there are more myosins attached for the B than the A or the C, and in fact, very few myosins are bound for the C. Now, if we run the simulation, you can see the dynamics of these things coming on and off are very different. Now, at time zero, what we did was we took that equilibrated situation, and then we changed the spring constant on which the actin was being pulled on. And you can see that the three different isoforms are able to recover their forces at very different rates because they have very different kinetics. So when you're thinking about the mechanobiology at a focal adhesion, it's really important to uh, consider which myosins are attached and the force generating, steady state force generating properties of the myosins. And it's important to consider um, uh, um, how many myosins are there because you'll have different amount of forces. And finally, I just want to end up uh, just by saying something very quickly uh, about the kinesin motors. Remember, these are microtubule motors that have really important roles of moving vesicles around on microtubules in live cells. And so in purple here, we have the microtubule tracks. And in green, we have uh, endosomes that are labeled for a very specific endosomal marker. And you can see these <clears throat> molecules moving along, finding their directions, uh, deforming the membranes, which requires force. Uh, and actually, if you look, you see some um, um, uh, fission occurring. So you're, these um, um, vesicles are being processed. Okay? So like the myosins, different kinesin isoforms have different force velocity curves. And in fact, they look very different than the myosin force velocity curve, where the, the myosins were more or less hyperbolic. The kinesins are pretty flat at low forces. They're largely insensitive to force at low forces. But not until high forces do you start to see um, changes in their velocity. OK. So with that, I will quit. Uh, and if there are any questions before you go to lunch, you can ask me now, or you can come up, and I'll stick around for a few seconds. Go to lunch. Okay.